how many ready for the word today? Bless God, we continue. Well, maybe this is going to be, well, I don't know that I'll ever stop talking about the value of the local church because that's something that was born real heavy in my life when I got born again and realizing the value for me, for my wife, for my children, for my grandchildren, and now for my great-grandchildren. I had an understanding early on, or at least a deep desire for God's house and God's word. And uh, I, I, just, I don't know why God gave that to me, except to say that he was, uh, had a plan for our lives to build strong homes and families. Strong word and faith families is the word that God gave to me for Living Word Bible Church. So when you attend here, God desires to work on your home and your family, word and faith. Hello. And uh, that's what you're submitting yourself to for the word of God to work and for the Holy Spirit to teach and to train and to help you to train your children and your grandchildren. Amen. Bless God. And I, I, so today I want to talk a little bit about the Sabbath. And uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of denominations born out of the Sabbath. There are uh, Seventh-day Adventists, good church, good organization, believes in Jesus, all that's good stuff. Anybody, Jesus said anybody's for me. Is not against me, and so we have to take that attitude towards it. But nonetheless, um, it puts them in a position that really doesn't fit into the church age. And uh, the Sabbath, Jesus said it this way, when they were talking to him about breaking in the Sabbath, Jesus said, you misunderstand, I am the Sabbath. Anybody home? Well, if he is the Sabbath... And he is, I am, the way and the truth and the life. What he's speaking was prophetically in the Old Testament all the way to now, prophetically speaking to us of the church that was to prepare the bride. Jesus the rock is the Jesus the Christ is the church. Amen. And God had the plan from the foundation of time for exactly that all the way back to the Garden of Eden when he planted the garden in the church or the family in the church. So this has been God's plan, and you heard me teach about the letter B, it, the house of the Lord, right from the very first letter. First letter of the first word in the Bible is preparing us for the thought idea of the house of the Lord. 240,000 times the house of the Lord is mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned more than any other word. Come on, somebody. Think about, was God trying to communicate something to us? Now, I know that uh, people that are sitting out there and in, in, uh, uh, watching on TV, and uh, it's all, I understand, it's all good. I understand so much of it. I know there are people that can't be in the church. God looks at your heart and knows if you want to be or not. That's something that's important for you to grasp. But he did plan something for the preparation of the bride that they would be prosperous or flourish if they're planted in the house of the Lord. Amen. So it's a process of being planted connected to, uh, giving in, receiving from, uh, gaining salvation, deliverance, repentance. Uh, that's what this house is all about, getting washed with the water of the word, getting rid of old wrong beliefs, doubt and unbelief, and gaining through the word of God something called faith that empowers us to change our tomorrow. Is there an amen out there? And so I guess I'm going to just start with this. So Lord, we just ask that you help me share this with truth and understanding that how you spoke it into being for us uh, so early on in your word and that it would be written on our hearts the understanding of what you were doing 
even as you wrote the Ten Commandments on our hearts now that we're born again. I ask, Lord, that you give revelation to the hearts, that this was one of the mysteries in your word that is being revealed today in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll know the story of the Ten Commandments, and uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to look at one of them particularly today, the one that deals with the Sabbath. And we understand that for 40, 430 years they were in the wilderness, and by grace of God or unmerited favor, which is how we all got born again, is by His merit, His goodness, His mercy that we might be forgiven for past, present, and future and be able to be born again and become or sit ourselves in a position of spirit, like spirit with Father God, a bride for Christ for the great wedding feast that is facing us and may be coming closer than we know today. And that the the house of the Lord was to prepare the bride for that. And how he worked that out with the fall and all of the things that took place and man trying to fulfill the Ten Commandments on their own works, he wrote the Ten Commandments on our hearts. So it is important to grasp in your born-again experience that God etched it not in stone now, but in your flesh, dirt, part of your heart your soulless realm, it is written all of the Ten Commandments. I know that I call them suggestions and I've been rebuked by Kenneth Copeland, so I've repented. Y'all okay? Uh, Nonetheless, uh, in my own heart, there's still suggestions, but that's okay. Oh well. Uh, Because I understand them as principles of God's Word, which uh, not one jot or one tittle of his principles will pass away, but the Mosaic law did pass away. Jesus fulfilled that. And so these, these principles of God are critical for our social life, our life here on earth. Did you hear what I'm saying? They are all critical to the best life on earth. They are the way. They are the truth. And they are unconditional love. Each one of them represent unconditional love because they were written by God for us. And now they're written by God for us on our hearts so that the Holy Spirit has something to work with that will guide us and help us live the best life on this earth. He can then guide us and say, no, that doesn't line up with a principle. Don't go that way. Go this way. This is what the Word says. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay. So they're written on our hearts, and if you need to read that, it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. In this covenant, I will make with them in those days. So those days are the church age. In those days he's talking about, or the day, Hebrews chapter 4 talks about today is the day, or the church age is now every day until Jesus comes back. And so he said, so the Lord, and I will put my laws, small prince principles, I will put my commandments in their heart and in their They were to be in our minds, too. That's why our founding fathers put them on the walls of the courthouse, why they put them in our national parks, why they used to be printed and put on walls in homes, in churches. Everywhere you went, your mind had the opportunity to read, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, what, what impact, if constantly the mind at least saw that, which is a seed planter to the heart, if the mind saw that regularly from early life, maybe it had been much easier to follow them, and we might not be where we are today as a society. Just a thought. 
So I believe they are necessary for society. But let's take this one scripture, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 through 11. It's interesting that many of them are stated in just a couple of sentences. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't murder. Have one God. Don't envy. Sometimes there's one or two sentences to explain it. But there are two particular that are really long and extensive in meaning. Honor your mother and father that your days might be long. This one actually has a promise in it, and it goes on to talk about it. Honor your parents. May not, may not deserve it, but there's something about us honoring. Hello? Something about honoring those that gave you life. Even if you didn't know who they were in some cases, you put honor in your heart because it says God will give you long life for it. And then we have this one, the Sabbath. And this one runs on as long as any of them. Then there's one word that's not with any of the other nine. This one has the word remember. Remember? I thought we should have remembered all of them. Would be good if we did. Hello? But God made a major point here of saying remember the Sabbath day. Now I know that if you take that at its face value, you could end up um, celebrating on Saturday as the Sabbath, because that was the seventh day. Hello? The end of the week. But when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, gave his blood and his life for our flesh sin, and resurrected he birthed something that is now called the church. And he birthed the church age. And Jesus being the Sabbath, every single day of the church age is the Sabbath. So you can have church, or sure, you can have church every single day. Morning, night, You can have church 24 hours a day because it is the church age. Now, that in Matthew, it says this. It says that the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. In other words, this was something that God from the foundation was making for his bride to be prepared. Are we getting the value? This is, this is what Jesus came and died for. I don't know how to give it more value than that. From my understanding. Prepared for all of us that are the temple of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to enter in and bring that Christ, the anointed one, into the house to empower it. And to be empowered. Well, to me that's it. So remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now this might be hard for some, but most, not all, most of the time that you read the word holy, it means purposeful or set apart for God's plans and purpose. It is not a cloud dweller. That's not holy. You are righteous, so you, you don't have to get holy, but you need to connect a purpose. God has a plan for every single life. He has a plan for every single church. He has a plan for every single person that's born on this earth. Not all of them find it. 
keep, how many know the word keep is holy? So the Sabbath is the church, it's Christ. It's where we are gathered today. But he uses the word keep. It's the same Hebrew word as in the Garden of Eden. He said, keep and tend. In the New Testament, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. As some are in the habit of doing. Hello? We're to keep, and this word gather, this get together, this word forsake, not the assembly. The assembly was mentioned also in Genesis that the assembly would rise up and flow out through four rivers. But the assembly could be also translated as to attend or tend or go to or bring your tithe to or is anybody home? So keep and tend are right here. But the word keep in the ancient Hebrew explains it this way. I desire for you to prosper. And here's how. This is, you know, people think that God just said keep and tend. And so they really didn't have much instruction. That's all we have in the Bible. But you have to understand that the word keep and tend had extensive meaning. So God had to have explained to them. Eat of the tree of life. Don't eat of that tree. That will kill you, but this one will give you life. He gave him instructions that if you're going to prosper in the garden, keep it intended, you need to eat of the tree of life, which is the word of God and what God has said, to ingest it, to let it give you the breath of life and bring the kind of life that would expand Eden to the world. Consume the word. But the word is the tenth, Christ Jesus, God's first name. Bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. Maybe better said, bring it and give it to Christ. Somebody get this. Bring it and give it to the anointed one who has the power to anoint multiply it, who multiplied the bread and the fish, come on somebody, and multiply it so that it can build the kingdom of God. But that's not the end of it. When we build his kingdom, he builds ours. When you build his house, the Bible said, he will build our house. I have experienced that. I started building a house up here on Nan Circle. They call it the castle. Grandkids call it the castle, whatever. Mansion. Uh, somebody built it for me after we wrote the millionaire book and he just came and said, oh, God told me to build your house. So, But it was after, we built this house. Are you... So the, the scripture is just saying here, if you want to prosper, here's how you do it. You build his house, he builds your house. You build his kingdom, he'll build our kingdom. The kingdom of God is in you. The word of God was designed to fill you or to prepare you as the bride of Christ. Are you getting this? Besides that he wants you to prosper and be in good health. I need to get um, a zero. I just went into the minus, did I? <sighs> okay. It says on the seventh day or the Sabbath, so now we've, we've confirmed that we celebrate typically as Christians or Christ in us. Christ in us is what Christian means. 
uh, those that claim to be Christians that don't have Christ in them are not. Anyway, I won't go there. It simply means Christ in you. Okay, so the seventh day, uh, the Sabbath of the Lord, your God, you shall do no work, nor shall your sons or daughters or maidservants, cattle, no work. And even the stranger that lives in your gates, which means this really is implying that we're supposed to bring the lost into the house too, you know. Because it's a house of salvation. Amen. That's what grows the kingdom. But when he said this, do no work, we have major misunderstanding again. Because if we're going to honor the Lord appropriately in the church, then you can't even work in the church. I couldn't even do what I'm doing. You couldn't even serve. You could this word work means stop your labor of provision anybody home and enter into the rest of the word of God to present our service our gifts our love our encouragement let all of our actions benefit others in his house. And we just choose the first day of the week because that's the day Jesus gave birth to the church. So when you come to church on Sunday, you actually celebrate his resurrection. Nobody got that. Think about it. That's why we celebrate on the first day of the week. We celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection. Not just Easter. Every time we come into the house of the Lord, we come with a thankful heart for what God has done and what God has provided for us and what he's provided for us as a church to train and prepare us for the best life on this earth and eternity with Christ Jesus as the bride prepared for him. Glory to God. He is preparing us. Mm, I don't know. I'm trying to get it across. See, religion even took this to the point that Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, were riding in a carriage on a Sunday. And he was arrested by the town sheriff. They were both arrested. They had no way of identifying themselves. And out of that experience, a letter was written to the Baptist pastor that has been used against our Constitution. <coughs> because religion said you can't use a horse and carriage. Listen, the Amish understand this scripture better than any of they use horse and carriage yet today on Sunday. The beasts of burden were used. The cows were milked. If you don't milk the cows, they dry up. Somebody. <laughs> and as a result, we came up with this idea of separation of church and state. This meant separate the state from the church, not the church from the state. Amen. Truth was to guide our nation, not lies. The Word of God. You had to be born again to hold an office all the way till 19, 1815. Well, I won't go any further with that. But understanding this scripture and applying it to today and our lives. For in the day of the Lord, 
The seventh day, the seventh day, the Lord blessed it. I'm going to end with this. He blessed it. This is why under the old covenant, it was blessing and cursing. Under the new covenant in the church age, it is blessing and blessing because the price and the curse has been paid for. And it goes one step further. The Bible says he hallowed the day. In other words, this is supposed to be the age of goodness of God. Hallowed means supreme goodness. We should be living in the goodness of God every single day if we simply follow his principles. Remember the Sabbath. And make sure you understand it has purpose in our lives. Keep it holy. And so ends the reading of the epistle today. I think I'm going to start the Abrahamic covenant. Oh, without a word from God, don't forget the book. Amen. You've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to receive him right now. God wishes none should perish, but all should come into the saving knowledge of Christ and really understand what God set up for your blessing, for your good. This is not for my good. This is for your good. And he gave us something called salvation. And we thank you, Lord, for it. Pray this prayer right now. You can receive Jesus right where you're at right now and change your life from darkness to light. Would you repeat after me? Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin, I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.